would like to thank uh, Princeton and particularly Professor James for, for organizing this event here this afternoon. Uh, it's part of a series of events we've been uh, organizing with, uh, with Mr. Brighting to present um, his new book, Swiss Made, which you can also buy uh, at the exit, and I recommend it. It's a, it's a very interesting read. Um, many of you probably are familiar with the, the cliches uh, that, are, that are most often associated with Switzerland, chocolate, cheese, banks, you name it. Um, and I think this presentation today is the occasion to give you another view of Switzerland um, and, and other strengths of this small uh, landlocked country. I'm a diplomat, so I'm paid to uh, promote my country, but um, Mr. Brighting here um, is not paid and he will nonetheless promote Switzerland, so I'm very happy to, to have him here this afternoon. So thank you all for, for coming. Thank you, Madam. Good afternoon, I'm Harold James, I'm the uh, director of the program on contemporary European politics and society uh, here in uh, Princeton. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, James Briding here uh, today. Um, I must say, uh, I grew up with all these uh, prejudices because, um, you, you know, the, my very favorite film is uh, the, the great Orson Wells uh, film with the, the, the third man, um, and uh, you, you remember this, this, this great line in the Prater Wheel in Vienna, in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias they had warfare, terror, murder and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci and the Renaissance. In Switzerland they had brotherly love, they had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Um, <laughs> well, um, uh, you, James Briding's book is, is really a nice, uh, I'm an economic historian, so I like this kind of stuff, um, a nice demonstration of the diversity of what it is that, uh, that Switzerland uh, actually does. Um, uh, Mr. Briding's the founder and the owner of Nascent's Capital, a Swiss investment firm in Zurich, um, came from the Templeton Investment Management and was before that in, in Rothschilds. Um, this book is actually originally evolved out of a cooperation he did uh, a few years ago on the Wirtschaftswunder der Schweiz, the economic miracle of Switzerland, uh, with the economics editor of the very influential uh, Swiss newspaper, the leading German Swiss newspaper, the Neue Zürich Zeitung. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, Mr. Breiding is, is here. He's going to talk about the book for about 25 minutes or so, then I'm going to ask a series of questions about the book, and then we'll open it up to a general discussion. <coughs> so thank you very much, James, for coming. Thank you. Is, it, is it on? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, um, Thank you, Professor James. Thank you, Nadine, and the Swiss Embassy for helping us organize this event. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Um, uh, writing a book is like a marathon, and um, it's, it requires an incredible amount of effort and stamina. And, and the journey started when I spoke to Professor James about three years ago. And um, during this sort of very formative and fragile stage when an idea germinates, um, he actually said it was quite a good idea. And, and actually that sort of opinion and advice was, was quite decisive in getting the necessary resolve going to do this sort of thing. Um, I have a fond sort of um, jealous um, feeling towards Princeton. They actually rejected me and it was because of that rejection that I applied to Harvard. And so <laughs> life is full of rejection and, and you know, <laughs> I just wanted to share that with you. So it's a, it's a special delight to be here and to be invited to come and speak here. <laughs> Anyway, so I, th I thought what I'd do is i just sort of go through the highlights of the book and then um, you know, feel free to, to buy it. I, I make about $1.50 per copy, so, which paid for my train fare um, from New York. Um, so let's just go through it quickly. And, and just, just actually to Professor James's point, the reason I actually wrote this book is having been quite familiar with, with Switzerland, I found that there was a, just a massive difference between what people perceive Switzerland to be and what it actually is. And there's a couple good reasons for that. First of all, the Switzerland was the crucible of the Protestant Reformation to some extent. And you had Swingley who came from Zurich and Calvin who was living in Geneva. 
and the Protestants are very sort of reticent people to talk about what they do, and, and it's really sort of against their customs to do so. We have an expression in German which is uh, sein and not shine, so substance instead of appearance. Um, the second point is that a lot of the industry and the prosperity uh, has been created by businesses and companies that are so-called B2B businesses, so they're machine companies or industrial companies. And we all know of Nestle and Swatch, but there's a lot of companies like ABB and the pharmaceutical companies um, who just have no real need to talk about what they're doing. In fact, the joke in, in the 1970s is a company called Hoffman Roche, which has a very important facility here in Nutley. And the joke was that the only number you found in the yearbook was the year. Those are incredibly discreet people. And I think the final reason is the Swiss are just not very good at selling themselves. So that was sort of the opportunity for me. But if you were to sort of Google um, Amazon, uh, you'd find Lonely Planet Guides or sort of sensational money laundering books. So just, you know, I think John Stuart Mill, famous uh, philosopher, said that the way you should measure any regime's success is the extent to which you can achieve the greatest good for the greatest number. And I think against these two metrics, uh, the Swiss have really been head and shoulders above any developed country. And just to look at the facts, um, Switzerland has the highest per capita GDP of, of any developed country and any country that does not have a natural resource endowment. Um, this compares it to sort of its main neighbors. And then more importantly, and particularly in a day and age like today where there's a, a growing sensitivity towards uh, inequality, the Swiss have managed to keep a relatively egalitarian and equitable distribu distribution of their income and productivity. This just shows you across, the, we took the top 10% of income earners, but you, it looks very similar, actually more acute if you take the top five or the top one. And it's not just the US, which is it's sort of a subject to criticism in this regard. If you look at places like Indonesia, Russia, Brazil, uh, the UK, very similar uh, developments. And, and all the studies show that there's a, a very disturbing correlation between um, rising inequality and, and, and rising instability, violence, um, et cetera. So it's, it's a pretty important part. And what I do in the book is to try to explain you know, how Switzerland managed to achieve that. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it is a small country. And in order, you know, if you look at the, the market, it has lots of choices. Customers can choose what they buy, and they, they choose the best, what's best, what's cheap. And most of the, the sort of accretion of wealth came from technology-driven um, inventions. Switzerland has the highest per capita number of Nobel Prize winners. Here's a couple examples of, of those. Um, if you look at, I lost it. The interesting thing is that most of these um, Innovations did not actually come from foreigners. They, they came from, or, or from Swiss people, but they came from foreigners. Um, Switzerland has the highest percentage of people of a foreign or origin living in the country. If you include the second generation, which they call secundos, and tend to be the most sought after people because they sort of still have the hunger, but they have also the accl acclimation, um, it's almost 30%, which is almost two to three times higher than most countries. But there's a second vector which is quite interesting, which is the number of people, Swiss people, living outside of Switzerland. And, and again, that's among the highest in the world. And these people are quite important because they're sort of touch points. They're much more familiar with what's happening outside, where are the opportunities, where are the risks. Um, and, and the whole sort of constellation of status quo is being challenged. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Professor Howard, Howard, Howard Gardner from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, but he wrote a book in, which really was a quite an important book for him, Creating Minds, where he studied 20 different people across uh, a cross-section of um, achievements, industrial, scientific, cultural. And his main finding was that you, know, you must go to a very different kind of place if you want to think in a new kind of way. And I think if you look at your own individual lives, you know, you, it was probably those points where you had to leave your comfort zone where you achieved the most progress in your life. I think the other thing that was interesting to me was that um, Joseph Schumpeter uh, sort of became famous with this whole notion of creative destruction, you know, the idea that it's quite good when things fail because it 
generates opportunities for other people to come in and fill the breach. Um, but the Swiss, being a small country, it's quite the opposite. Uh, the average age of Swiss companies, they just don't seem to die. Um, while if you look at the average age of an American company, it, it continually goes down. And you have a lot of, a lot of loss of institutional memory. Um, I, I remember reading a, a report of um, the, 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 the former CEO of um, Intel, and he was, he was sort of describing the, bat the battery industry in the United States, how it used to be producing sort of 95% of the world's batteries, and then it was completely outsourced um, to China. And now with this sort of lithium battery technology becoming important once again, there's just no institutional memory. There's no more, there's no more technology know-how. And it's the Chinese, of course, who are taking advantage of that. The Swiss have been very good about preserving the sort of value components of their business, particularly the research and development side. And that probably explains why they've been able to survive in, you know, the, the, the duration of the companies. In terms of how they allocate capital, which is an important measure for any economist, uh, we looked at sort of the, the peers of Swiss companies. So we compared Nestle against Dannon and Unilever. We compared Schindler against Otis. We compared Novartis and Roche against Glaxo and Bristol Myers and, and uh, Pfizer. And they actually achieved almost double the returns over a 20, 30 year period. And they managed to do that by having significantly less leverage. So they had better returns with less risk, which is sort of the ideal um, combination to have. Um, this is just a point about the sort of the, what I think is a superior social contract, this, this sort of grand bargain of what you give up in exchange for what you get from the government. If you look at education, you know, public schools in Switzerland are really the superior choice. If you go to a private school in Switzerland, it's considered to be a sort of a negative stigma that you, you, you sort of failed. Um, and you know, it, it sort of strikes me in places like this country in the UK that you're paying for education, but the, you know, the people um, don't really use it. You know, most, most people, I guess, I don't know how many people here, how many people here went to private schools? Just a show of hands. I mean, one? <laughs> OK, I doubt that. But <laughs> OK, so if you look at the, the sort of the, the feeling of safety component, the police force, I think Switzerland ranks as being one of the safest places in the world. Uh, neutrality has been quite good in terms of defense. It's very expensive to finance the war in Iraq, etc. Social security, each person has his own individual account. So I have and, and Nadine has her own individual account where money is deposited into your social security account. So it's your money. It's not a sort of a notional promise or an entitlement. You get a statement every quarter from the bank. You can't touch it until you're 65. <coughs> Unless you move, you can then take the money or you can use it for a house but it's actual physical account, your money, not a promise. And uh, infrastructure, all that works, roads, bridges, post, for example, FedEx is very successful in this country, largely because the post service is not particularly efficient. Uh, we don't really have a, a competitor FedEx in Switzerland. I think one of the, the, the main reasons for Switzerland's success is it's a very different architecture about how it, do, how it does things. It's very much a, a sort of bottom-up society. Um, compared to other countries which are sort of top down. So you, you don't have anybody in Switzerland sort of deciding that we should be getting into um, ethanol with corn or um, you know, we should be in the automobile industry sort of directives as you see in places like Singapore, France, even to some extent this country. Um, the, the government itself, self, as you know, is, is most people maybe know, it's a direct referendum government, so it's, it does not rely on uh, elected officials as much. It's really the it's the it's the vote of the individual people on all important matters. So it really is a government of the people for the people, and that's probably the most uh, important distinction between its form of democracy, which is otherwise replicated based on the U.S. model. The whole constitution was replicated based on the U.S. model, except to that one very important extent. Uh, maybe another distinction is um, if you look at sort of you know, how. Um, I sort of compare industrial policy versus political policy. You know, the Swiss have been very imperialistic from an industrial point of view. You know, companies like Nestle are it's the biggest, most profitable company in the world, and they've been very you know, expansive with regard to their industrial developments. Uh, you have two of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, second largest reinsurer, 
two of the largest banks. So they've been very sort of expansionist on the industrial side, but they've been very insular on the political side. And it's this sort of very unique combination of a, a weak government and a strong economy which has characterized much of the Swiss success. This is just some, you know, a, a ragtag of statistics that in my, you know, sort of try to give you a bit of a flavor and, and give you a, a sort of a pattern. Public debt is a percent of GDP. Um, to what extent do you live within your means? Uh, Swiss is 44% compared to 203%. How important is government as a, as a, in terms of competing and providing services in the, into the economy? It's more than twice the level um, compared to Switzerland. Exports as a, as a percent of GDP, which is a, a true test of vitality and competitiveness if you're able to export your products to other countries. Uh, almost 51% in Switzerland versus 14. Uh, global competitiveness is ranked by the World Economic Forum. The Swiss have been ranked number one for three years in a row. The U.S. is not now ranked number seven, down from number five last year and down from number two about five years ago. Uh, S&P rating, uh, Switzerland AAA, U.S. AA plus, actually Nestle, uh, there's about seven companies in Switzerland have a, have, a, have a better credit rating for their debt who, where investors believe that they're more likely to repay their debt than the U.S. government. Not much, but, some, but to some extent. Um, unemployed youth, uh, actually, sorry, I get that number is the opposite way around. It's, sorry, made a mistake. Percent of, uh, percent of members of com Congress who are lawyers in this country, nearly 50%, only 6%. So, you know, this notion of uh, can one particular type of um, profession, you know, I mean, you really need to represent, have more representative types of people to, to represent the true interests of this constituents. Um, percent of elite who have attended schools, is why I doubt this number in this, in this room, but you have 90% of people in Switzerland. If you look at sort of the board, members of board of directors and companies, members of parliament, et cetera, it's nearly 90% who went to public schools. And here in this country, of course, is substantially less. Uh, this is sort of the notion of how important parents are to education. Uh, all the studies show us it's concerned parents, concerned mothers in particular, that have an important impact on education. Amount of hours to complete a tax return, 22 hours versus four hours. Anyone who's done a tax return here probably knows the um, percent of obesity, um, body mass index above 30, it's, it's nearly three and a half times. Um, the, actually, the Swiss is the num Swiss is number three, and the, and the U.S. is the worst among the OECD countries. And then again, the CO2 emissions, the, the Swiss has have the best, and the, um, the U.S. has the worst. Just a couple sort of anecdotal stories because we have 14 chapters. You know, each industry is covered. So, you know, just to sort of be very brief about it. But you know, the Swiss it all really started with milk. Um, the Swiss did, did not have really fertile land. They weren't particularly attractive to the sort of other European monarchies. That's why to, to some extent they were able to avoid feudalism. But what they did have is they had cows that were grazed in high elevations. Uh, milk is a very chem chemically unstable product. It deteriorates very rapidly. And having cows that actually uh, live at 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 meters extended the sort of life of milk. And that was a, a huge advantage. And if you think about the, the sort, of, sort of products that were important, in the food industry, it was to try to get as many calories as possible that lasted as long as possible. And if you think about it, it's things like chocolate, cheese, uh, yogurt. And this was sort of the, how the Swiss became about. They actually um, started with condensed milk, and Henry Nestle discovered uh, uh, powdered milk, which was very important, for, particularly for women. So it was sort of the first liberalizing product for women. It enabled women to work in factory, sh factory floors um, who otherwise would have to nurse their children. Carnation wasn't Swiss, but it was acquired by Nestle. This is just sort of examples of, of companies you may know. Nestle actually as a company does not try to appear Swiss. They try to appear very locally, and they're really emphasizing their brands and the local nationality. Uh, but I remember Peter Brock at Probeck told me that they have three, three billion people per year, per day, buying their products. And it's probably the most effective democracy in the world, because housewives are, are very meticulous people. They're very price conscious. And so it's a, sort of a voting system every day. And I think, uh, for me, that was quite intriguing. 
this fellow on the left is a fellow called Badrut, who owns the, the started the Palace Hotel and the Colm Hotel. And there's sort of an amusing story about tourism. Um, tourism wasn't a particularly interesting business because it was a three-month summer geared industry where typically uh, sort of eccentric, aristocratic English people came to climb mountains. Um, and you know, one summer he convinced 15 of them and, and placed a wager that if they came to Switzerland during March that one day they'd at least have short sleeve shirts. And lo and behold, they came back and he promised if it didn't happen, he would pay for the expenses, including their hotel and transport. And they came back and it, it snowed the entire time. And English, no disrespect intended, Professor James, but they, they, they quite liked to drink and they took sort of their silver trays and one, one day they slid down on their rears to a place called Shell Arena, which is uh, the Cresta Run, which is one of the, well, the, it's the oldest um, toboggan run in the world and a very prestigious club. And that sort of kick-started the whole tourism industry because from that point forward, it was a seven-month, eight-month industry instead of a three-month industry and you could do a lot more. Um, and it was mainly a household sort of driven um, industry and, and one of them was a fellow by the name of Cesar Ritz who was quite a good hotelier. Um, and he then started a chain called Ritz Hotels, which is now one of the leading luxury hotels uh, in the world. Um, Nicholas Hayek was you know, many considered to be the founder and discoverer <coughs> of, of Swatch. Um, it's not the case, but um, you know, just we did a lot of research talking to various parties. And what you do learn about success is that it has many fathers. Lots of people claim to be the person who was um, decisive in particular success. But the one story that I thought was maybe sort of an unsung hero was this fellow, um, Jean Robat. And what was happening is that Swatch went bankrupt. They were effectively bankrupt, and the banks didn't want to give them any more money. The Japanese had cre created the battery-operated watches, uh, watches, and they were superior in terms of telling time and much cheaper. And the Swiss had been producing watches for centuries, and, and for them it was a, a, you know, a lot of pride involved in, in producing a watch that lasts for a couple of generations. So they came up with this crazy idea of, of creating a plastic watch, and they, they had a pilot market in San Antonio and Osaka, and, and Ernst Tomke was coming back from the pilot market in Osaka and they just had a black watch and a, and a brown watch, sort of military looking watches, and they were a complete flop. And they stopped at Bloomingdale's to, to learn that Bloomingdale's was getting ready to kick out all the, the Swiss watches. And the fellow who's the buyer is a Brooklyn sort of tough uh, retailist, told Mr. Tomke, well, the whole idea about watches shouldn't be about telling time, it should be about fashion. Um, and then he went back and, and called this fellow up who actually um, turned around, helped turn around, became the designer of a, of a sort of a very boring woman's underwear company, which is now called Fogal. And he, this fellow here on the left was actually designing pantyhose, because pantyhose you can produce for, say, $1 and sell for $40 or $50. It was a way to sort of, for, for Swiss people to, um, you know, be able to pay the wages that, that, that you know, because of all the, the pressure and cost pressure in, in Asia. So this fellow designed the first 385 watches of Swatch, and it wasn't that long ago that people would line up at night um, waiting for the new Swatch to come out the same way they do with the iPads and iPods. But it was very difficult to convince the watch industry to change the sort of mindset of selling a watch for $20 that would only last for three or four months and people would throw away. The, the whole ethos um, was pretty ingrained. Um, here, a company called Schindler, it's the world's largest producer of elevators. Um, a lot of the technology in Switzerland was to get people up into mountains, which also helped the, the tourism industry. Um, it wasn't that long ago that you had to have a manual operator. And there was a fellow who produced this algorithm that directed traffic from sort of low floors, medium floors, and high floors. And that really enabled uh, Schindler to go from being number 12 to, to number one in the world. Um, Chemistry was very important uh, in Switzerland, um, largely beca on the fact because of the fact that the, the British Empire controlled a lot of the natural resources, and it was very difficult to get some of these natural resources. One of the most important was was actual colors for textiles, and it came from plantations like indigo, and the British English Empire was sort of conserving that for themselves. So there was the Germans who who actually came up with these ideas of replicating these synthetically. Up until World War II, you had to speak German if you were a chemist because textbooks were in German. Um, and these are two 
quite famous chemist, uh, the one on the left, actually discovered Valium uh, not too far from here. He was a Polish Jew <coughs> who went to work for Roche. Roche was the only chemical company. There was four at the time, um, Geige, Siva, Sando, which are now consolidated into Novartis. Um, and then there was Roche. And Roche was the only company that hired Jews because the CEO was, was married to a Jew. And um, went with the whole Nazi regime, these people who were displaced had to go to, um, to survive. Um, they, they hired Steinbach and they set up Nutley, New Jersey to actually house the Jews that were working for Roche. And they actually created a, a legal structure where Roche owned the entire world's assets of, of, of Roche in the event that the Nazis were to come to Switzerland. He created a compound called Valium. He thought it was an antibiotic. And one day a student noticed when they were doing a test on mice that this one particular mouse was, was the tail was falling down. And they said, well, it's not that the wound's not healing, but the, the, you know, something's happening. And they realized that it was making him feel very relaxed and then good. And that was actually the first blockbuster drug ever of, of any pharmaceutical. It was really the opening of the entire pharmaceutical industry, which largely was in this part of the world, within 150 kilometers of here. And uh, that became a, the most profitable um, drug in the history of Switzerland. It was called Mother's Little Helper in the Rolling Stones song. I don't know if anyone's heard that song. But, you know, here it comes, 19th nervous breakdown. Um, and it was uh, still one of the very few drugs today that effectively works on the brain, which is very complicated. Um, and they're still trying to sort of sort it out. If you look at things like Alzheimer's, they're making you know, remarkably little progress in therapies with regard to the brain. Uh, sort of a, sti a story of humility. Um, Paul Miller, uh, anyone, any, does anyone know what he created here? Yeah. yeah. So Paul Miller um, was working on a dye stuff, a color, and he went on vacation. And he left this particular compound in his office. He came back two weeks later, and there were a lot of dead flies. And you know, sure enough, uh, whoever guessed it right, it was the first um, pesticide, um, and it was a huge hit. It was very rapidly working, very cheap. It did not have an odor, did not require ingestion, um, and it was a, it was a blockbuster uh, product for about 20 years. He produced, he actually invented it in 1942. He won the Nobel Prize in 1948, um, and it was only 20 years later when uh, Rachel Carson um, featured that as sort of the poster child in um, The Silent Spring. But in his speech uh, in 1948, he sort of uh, predicted the uncertainty, and, uh, and basically he said in his speech that there's, you know, to this day we know quite a lot, but we still know very little in it about the relationship between the constitution of a compound and its ultimate impact. So it was sort of a warning, and it's quite, if you're interested, you should just Google his speech, and it's, for me, it was quite, quite humbling to read. So I, I just come to a close, but uh, all this was quite wonderful, um, but the whole sort of uh, architecture of economies has changed. Uh, here are two signs on the left of towns in Switzerland. Bühler is the world's leading producer of pasta machines, 80% of the world's pasta machines. If you eat pasta, uh, the chances are, you know, eight out of 10 of those uh, times that, that the, the pasta was produced by them through one of their, wheat doesn't even come from Switzerland. And about 60% of the employees in this town work for this particular company. Um, and you know, and Holder Bank is actually the, the company that's, they changed their name meanwhile to a company called Holson, which is the world's leading producer of cement. And what I do is I depict on the right side an aircraft carrier because I think the world has very much changed. Um, we have Google's uh, biggest operation in Switzerland outside of the United States and it, I spent two days there and, and they're featured in one of our chapters, Why Multinationals Love Switzerland. But it's very difficult for me uh, to understand who's producing what, where, and if you sort of follow the whole tax debates right now in the UK, companies like Amazon, um, Starbucks, uh, Google, they're really trying to come to grips with sort of equitability of taxes and, and really is where, where is this money coming from and, and who, who deserves it. And most of the multinationals in Switzerland, about 25% of the economy are these multinationals, not just Swiss, but also foreign multinationals. And they increasingly allocate resources be it people, technology, capital, uh, like a chessboard, to wherever they're the most efficient. And so I, I sort of use it as an aircraft carrier because I sort of use Switzerland to come and go and refuel. And it's a, a attractive nameplate 
but you know, it's a very different um, constellation of, of, of actors than we've had in the past. Well, one of the fam most famous immigrants is close to you, and uh, that was Albert Einstein. He uh, studied at ETH and failed his entrance examination, uh, and he became a junior patent investigator at a very junior level. Um, and he wrote his four key thesis papers in Bern, uh, and later came here um, and became very famous. But he's one of these immigrants that we talked about. And these immigrants are very interesting because they tend to leave their families and their support groups, and they don't belong to the country club. Uh, they tend to be much more um, risk-seeking. Uh, and um, on balance, have, have really, if you look at the achievement of Swiss pr prosperity, and you, do, and you see the same in this country, uh, um, Sergey Brin from, from um, Google is a, a Russian Jew. The fellow who founded eBay was it Iranian. Jeff Bezos from Amazon um, grew up in Cuba. So it's not something unique to Switzerland. It just comes to, it just tends to manifest itself there more. So I think I'll just finish on that and um, let Professor James take it over. Thank you so much. Switzerland as a model for other countries has been quite intensive for quite a long time. At the end of the 19th century, there's a book that I still use for my history courses uh, to describe uh, European politics in the 19th century. It's called The Government and Politics of Continental Europe uh, by A. Lawrence Lowell, a very, very famous uh, intellectual figure, giant of the late 19th century, president of Harvard. Um, and uh, one of the fascinating things about Lawrence Lowell is that he devotes more attention to Switzerland mm. and uh, Switzerland as a model for a federal democracy than he mm. does to the larger European countries, to, to the German Empire or to um, Austria. <coughs> um, and at the moment, uh, Switzerland is in a very peculiar position because it's in the middle of Europe. You know, if you take a Euro bill, you will see a map of Europe reproduced on, on it. Um, and uh, so, so Switzerland is there in the middle. They don't actually color it white in the Euro banknote. But uh, Switzerland is kind of an island surrounded by the European mm. Union, uh, by an area that's in a really very clear uh, crisis of governance. Um, so you, know, you have the comparison of Switzerland and the United States. Um, so some of the points are obviously uh, difficult to compare. I mean, for instance, when you compare exports, um, the United States is a very large economy, so it's, mm. it's very obvious it's not going to export as much as a small economy. But uh, when you do the European comparison, um, do you see any elements, in particular in regard to the tradition of government, in regard to the tradition of democracy, which is, I think, uh, one of the things that the Swiss rightly pride themselves on, uh, do you see something mm. that Europe um, can learn from uh, Switzerland or should yeah. learn from no, I, th I think they, they can. I, um, in fact, I, we say that in the, in the closing chapter that I think uh, Europe is trying to sort of figure out who it, want, who it wants to be when it grows up. And I think this sort of evolution that it's going through is, is probably not too different than the same the evolution that Switzerland went through when you know, Switzerland's 26 cantons in the beginning was a much smaller number. Um, and I, I remember speaking to a fellow who's a, quite an important fellow in Basel, ran the Swiss Banking um, Association, and he said in Basel, um, we didn't want to have uh, be part of anyone that was a city-state, and so they sort of shopped around for the cheapest social contract they could, as though they would be a farmer looking for a cabbage at the market, and they just wanted to sort of give up the least amount of freedoms. And you know, they had 320 different banknotes at the time, and. and it, it was very difficult to convince people to do a, a Swiss national bank, um, but ultimately they got there. And I think if you look at the, you know, if you I just read, reread recently the the Federal's papers, and you know that was also, you know, if you look at the evolution, it wasn't too different. You had these these colonies, and and you know Hamilton Jay and Madison wrote these papers um, trying to convince New York, uh, who was considered to be a, a very important swing state, 
to join the seven states. Um, it turned out that New Hampshire came in and they didn't have to convince New York. But it, you know, it was very much sort of autonomous states who didn't really want to give up their sovereignty and, and be part of something bigger, et cetera. Um, so I, I do think that the, you know, my argument is that Europe will need to go that same painful process. Um, but you know, the idea of having um, sort of a, you know, a central bank which is somehow divorced to the, the political process, I, I think is probably long-term not a viable solution. But so yeah, I do think that the Swiss, this sort of Swiss model of the federation could be something that the Europeans could, could, could study and it won't be replicated one-to-one, -one, et cetera, but um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think on, on, the, on the democracy side, I think, uh, you know, I think that uh, the Swiss um, democracy is incredibly unique and I, th I wish people would do more study about to what extent a, a direct form of government because you know, we're really at a stage now where there's so little trust in public officials. And you know, when Madison, I mean, who Madison actually looks in, in, in federal papers, he was a sort of big proponent of representative government. But you, know, you have to realize back then, A, it took a day or a day and a half to get on your horse and, and go vote. Um, and you, know, you had your gun and you were surrounded by Indians and your wife and your children. Um, you know, B, you, at that time, you know, an incorporated company uh, didn't really exist. You know, you had butchers, you had bakers, you had farmers, but you know, Nestle is, you know, has r revenues which are ten times the budget of Switzerland. So you have these massive companies, and if you see the sort of lobbying groups and the extent of influences that they have um, on this country, I mean, that sort of that sort of um, doesn't happen in Switzerland because the individuals have a much greater responsibility in terms of what they're doing. You know, to what extent that can be replicated is, is, is a very, probably a much more complicated discussion. I mean, what do you think? I mean, you know, maybe yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think one of the fascinating issues is the extent to which, uh, this, is, this is an old debate in political theory, and uh, Montesquieu had a very famous mm. set of reflections on this, that uh, you, democracy uh, worked, but only in a small setting, and so it becomes very, very difficult to scale it up. And yeah. you, it, it, it's in essence also some of This was a, a moment that, at least to, to many people, uh, to, I, have to say, I, I felt this as well. Uh, what the financial crisis showed very, very clearly uh, was that very large banks in very small countries are extremely vulnerable. And so we think of uh, Iceland, uh, we think of Ireland. Yeah. Uh, but you, you had, and it was very publicly discussed in Switzerland, this problem that the discussion with the, the Swiss National Bank took a very active role in, in pushing a solution on this, but it was very controversial. Yes. Um, so I wondered, when you think about the future, uh, do you think of Switzerland as a country where financial services play much less of a role than they did yeah. in the late 20th century or the early 21st century? Well, this, yeah. I mean, first of all, the Swiss economy actually did very well through the crisis. So if you look at, you know, they had, a, a, I think, a decline of productivity of 1.2%. So of all the economies, they, they managed to sort of get through better than anyone, um, despite having a huge debacle with UBS, which was sort of our version of um, Citibanks and the other sort of examples, Barclays, where you had state intervention and bailouts. Um, 
just a couple words to the origins of, of Swiss bank secrecy, because Switzerland has two really sort of three components of banking. One is a retail business, which is no different than mortgage lending and, and any other deposit taking, mortgage lending, um, commercial lending. That's probably not so important in this discussion. Um, there's, a, there's a second component, which has really been the kind of the sweetest fruit for Switzerland, which is their, their private banking, which be, and I just have to say a few words about how that came about. And then there's a third component, which is investment banking. Um, and, and this is no, really no different to what Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch and these sort of people have been doing. Um, so you'd have to sort of break down those three, but just talking about the, the, the middle one, which is really the most important because Switzerland is the largest home of offshore money, which is a, something very contentious for the time being. But th they had this bank secrecy law that came about because when, when Huguenots came to, from France because they were feared for their lives, um, uh, and then the Jews came um, and also feared for their lives, they not, they not only feared their lives, but they feared their property. And, and in order to protect not only their lives as refugees, but also their property, they had this bank secrecy because people actually tended to, to follow them and wanted to get to sort of um, put at risk both of those things. And it wasn't until income taxes became more important, and so you, you had this shift towards socialistic tendencies where income tax became very important. But I think the first income taxes came out in 1908 or something, and then but then you had countries like Scandinavia and other parts of the world where income taxes, marginal income taxes were 70, up to 70%. And then it became a, a huge incentive to try to avoid that. And a lot of this money came and sort of came into Switzerland, not because the banks were very good, actually. The UBS and Credit Suisse were not particularly good banks, but the Swiss National Bank was an incredibly good um, central bank. And, and if you look at any, all you have to do is look at the currency since 1972, because 1972 is when they, they got rid of the, the, the sort of the, the direct um, conversion rates to gold, and from that point, people had to have a faith. Took a, they took a wager on how competitive a country was and how prudent the country was, and the Swiss franc is appreciated massively compared to other countries. And because on on average three percent per year, which is a which is a huge yield, and that attracted a lot of capital. Um, but that that whole sort of uh, source of earnings and income is, is very much challenged right now uh, because of this tax equitability argument. And in my view, that will go down. So I think the, to answer your question, I think that that portion of the banking business will reduce considerably. I, I think the investment banking uh, part of the business, I, I think not just in Switzerland, but I think in a lot of places is being revised and, and probably is not a bad thing that uh, you know, most, most studies show that you know, Banking, inter, inter, banking serves as sort of an intermediation business, and it should be somewhere between 4 and 8% of the economy. In, in Switzerland, it's about 11, so it's probably too high. But I think it's going down, and you're seeing that already, and um, I think that will continue. So they'll have to figure out a way to replace those jobs, in my view. Yeah, I, th I think the investment banking is, is, is problematical. It's the private asset management. In, it, it, in the EU, you have this issue of the relationship of the size of the balance sheet to yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think mixing investment banking and other kinds of banking is good. Yeah, and I, I think you get back to the glass steagall arguments, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a reversion back to that because it's, I mean, particularly if you, ha you have this fundamental conflict where if the government is insuring deposits for small deposit holders, it raises the inevitable conflict that, you know, should you be conducting businesses which could eventually put the balance sheet at risk and then ultimately call on the the, you know, the, the government to pick up the tab. And, and I think people just have a very uncomfortable, it's very difficult to reconcile these two aspects. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you, if you, if you have some sort of you know, Glass-Steagall type separation as you had, and it, it happened to work quite well. And, <coughs> and, and then the, uh, my final question, and I will then open it up. Mm. Um, uh, how do you see uh, Switzerland's relationship with uh, the rest of Europe? You know, I think they've managed to do it through, as you know, through sort of negotiated treaties and agreements. Um, if, you, if you look at the function of the whole objective of Europe was the free flow of people, capital, and goods. And I think you know, to a large extent that's been achieved. You don't have to wait. You know, it's, it's very easy to, you can transfer money without any repercussions between countries. 
uh, if you have a Swiss passport. I mean, they now have just introduced limitations, but by and large, if you have a Swiss pa a European passport, you can live and work in Switzerland and vice versa, and goods can come and go. Um, so you, I think to a large extent, people overestimate just how important it is. I think for the Swiss, I mean, who's to say what the future holds, but I think for the Swiss, they put a huge amount of um, value on their sovereignty and, and um, and I think they're also very, having been very successful, um, I think they're very loath to consider you know, a, a something unproved and, and inferior to what they currently have. But that could change, of course, if circumstances change. I, I, I think particularly worried, um, uh, this is a discussion that goes on in Sweden and in Norway as well, um, as a small country with a very good governance system and a very stable currency, that you become a kind of safe haven currency and that that yeah. produces an appreciation of the exchange rate that yeah. makes it then unmanageable for your, your dynamic export funds to really It is, and, and, it, and that's actually happening now, and, and there's a, a conflict of interest be from you know, being a safe haven and also having a, a currency which is, keeps profit margins competitive with your customers. And we're seeing that now, that uh, there's been a, a huge participation in this QE movement uh, it, it's it's not desirable by the by the Swiss National Bank, but they have to do that in order to k keep some sort of uh, relation with the, particularly the euro because that's the biggest trading partner. Um, but if they were to let that run, uh, you know, the, the cost of production of these Swiss companies would just be too expensive, and they would no longer be competitive. So it's it's uh, it is a, a you know sort of a two-edged sword, but it's difficult. So thank you for the tour, Dorito. I saw a question already here. Uh, It seemed to me like like the central point that you're making here in a way is that there's something unique about the Swiss economic, political, and social system that makes it a center of innovation. And um, that, that does seem to be the case. Then at the same time, um, there is this contrast that you set up on so many levels with the US in terms of them being at polar ends of the OECD on a number of measures, yet the U.S. is also kind of known for facilitating innovation. So I wonder, I, I, I'm, I'm just, the, there seem to be these two such different models, but yet innovation seems to be part of the core of what you spoke about today. So I just wondered what you thought about that. Um, and then also, this is, I'm a sociologist, so this is maybe not a fair question for you, but you, you also kind of mentioned um, the, refer the referendum system as being one of the, the big reasons that you think that Switzerland's gone on a different path from other countries. And I, I wonder about the downside of um, referenda for example, I mean the, the kind mm. of tyranny of the majority problem and how For rights, what, which problem? the tyranny of the majority problem, mm. so just the idea that human rights shouldn't be put up for vote because like we saw with Proposition 8 in California and people voting <coughs> against same-sex marriage there even though the courts had legalized it and then in Switzerland women didn't have the right to vote until the 70s, which made them, I believe, the last um, industrialized developed country because it was, you know, had to be put up for a vote. Um, and yeah, my, fi my final question was a very simple one. Were, when you were talking about public education, were you talking about <coughs> secondary education or tertiary? Primary, secondary education. Secondary education. And so 90% of our members of Congress went to private high schools. No, it's pri either private uh, universities, high schools, or okay. so all all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, just, that I, I, I'm sorry. Are you finished with that? I'm sorry. We'll take the questions in turn. Though. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so that uh, Mr. Brady can reply. So I, I think on the innovation side, I think the, the U.S. is a very vibrant and innovative society, and I, I don't have really have any criticisms about that. And I think if you look at this per GDP per capita chart, the U.S. is also a you know, robust economy, and up until recently, et cetera. 
I, I think it's more the distribution, uh, you know, sort of a winner-take-all society versus a more equitable society that the focus of my comments and analysis is. Um, so um, no criticism on the innovation side. I think you know a lot of that has to do with the education system here, and it's a sort of a beacon for immigrants and people coming. I, I remember at Harvard, I think half or sixty percent of our students in grad school were coming from different countries. So, yeah. So that's um, and the second one was yeah the referendum system is you know I think that's the people see that the, the failure of, of California is, is being sort of oh well gosh you know it must be a bad thing I, I just you know I just when I, when I look at just how appalling the, the trust in public officials here is and when you look at how obvious the, the, the conflict of interest is between you know uh, lobby groups who, who actually fund and enable people to get into office and, and once you're into office of course it's it's very difficult to, um, to you know, it is a huge advantage to the incumbent, and the interest to serve that lobby group versus the interest to serve the constituents. And then, if you look at technology now, and you know, compared to back then with horses in one day, and now the internet, and I mean, effectively, you could have real-time voting on on anything. I think the downside, which is the right discussion, is that I think it requires a certain responsibility and a certain self-reliance, where you know people actually engage in these issues and, and but the whole idea is a freedom of press and freedom of debate and freedom of discussion and uh, let the people decide uh, and if they're engaged and informed and critical you, you should have a better outcome than uh, passing things over to elected officials who may or may not have your best interest in mind the, th the third point was uh, was yeah, I think, I, think on the, I think on the education yeah. side, is, you know, just, just a couple points there. That, you know, they're very simple things. You know, being a teacher in Switzerland is, is a very, there's a high, deg high degree of self esteem of being a teacher in Switzerland. You know, in the, they're, they're very well respected in the community, they're revered, they're well paid, they have a lot of time off. It's just a great profession, so it attracts good people. And I think if this country were to do that, they would have, it would probably take care of 80% of the criticisms. Um, and then the other, and the, and the other element which is very just important is that there's a dual passage, there's a dual pathway, this notion that you have to go to university in order to, you know, the, the, the more education you have should translate into greater income. I, I think people are saying that that, that requires revision. It's not, it's not happening. Um, and, you know, what, what the Swiss do is that they have this apprenticeship route where people can, like this fellow from the elevators, I mean, he's, he's sort of a sophisticated engineer. He makes a very good living. He's making $100,000 a year, and he's respected, and he's esteemed. And, you know, again, you sort of have this winner-take-all that if you went to Princeton, everything's great, and if you went to community college, then, you know, you're the winner, you're the loser. And, and that's why you have this disparity, equitability, in my opinion. And uh, so those, those are just two comments about education. Yes. Mm. One of the striking things about Switzerland is that not only is it a fairly small country to start with, but it has these 26 different cantons, and they have really or real significant levels of autonomy in them. To what extent do you think that this sort of radical decentralization has influenced Swiss policy and economic development? Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, I, I really think that um, if you read the sort of the Federalist Papers of you know, people who are sort of trying to put their thoughts together about this country, they, there was a lot of skepticism about central power. And, and any, you know, they looked at Julius Caesar's and they looked at Greece. And there's a natural tendency, it seems to be a physical law, that power percolates to the top. And you have this sort of this, this and this was what Montes you know, Montesquieu was the, you know, really decisive in that regard in terms of checks and balances and separations of powers, et cetera. Um, and I think the Swiss are just, have just stuck to that and said you know, they're very skeptical about anything that's centralized. So they push down tax assessment and tax spending is passed down to the lowest common denominator. People know if they build a hospital, how much it costs and you know, whether they need it and should they raise taxes to, to pay for it. I don't, you know, when I look at what laws passed here, it's, you know, there's sort of salami approaches where it's, it's very difficult to understand what's being paid and who's paying for it. And 
it's, I think this, you know, I don't call it radical, it's just decentralized. I think this country was not too different. I think it was much more decentralized than people. It was really this issue about national security that, um, that you know, propelled this country into a more centralized form of government, in my view. But I think it, 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 sh it should be something to be debated and discussed. And, uh, you know, a mayor in this country, I remember at Harvard we had three visiting mayors, the former mayor of Seattle, Miami, and, um, and one other city. And th they were telling me that just the, the, how difficult it is for them to get funding. You know, they have to go get approvals from the state, and you know, that's, then the state has to go to the federal government. And you know, a mayor of a big city like Miami and Seattle, he should, you know, the Swiss would think he should have more autonomy because that's where the rubber hit, hits the road. Maybe it should be radi maybe, maybe it's radical centralization instead of you know, maybe just, just to use your word. You know. <laughs> the second most prominent Swiss resident that I know about your tour. Mm. And uh, he uh, went apoplectic <clears throat> over um, uh, certain uh, things that the, the federal council, which I don't know about, the federal council is doing to destroy Swiss competitiveness. Mm. Now, I know you probably say that you know, it's federal, so it doesn't go down, and it all comes from up. But he is reporting um, an increasing incidence of incipient Exodus from Switzerland of the wealth creators that has, has become um, heavy in crime. Yeah. Uh, out of the fear, I think, of maybe some of that populism spilling over. Yeah, I, you know. I mean, there has been some groping towards centralization. If you look at the, you know, the amount of debt in Switzerland, it's forty-four know, percent. Twenty years ago, it was ten percent. So you're, you know, you're you're having some of that migration, but um, I still think on a relative basis, it's 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 much better off than some of these other places. France has six, sixty percent of the French economy is controlled by the government. So, so you don't think mm -hmm. that, that that this federal council is going to have much of it? Well, he may, be re he may be referring to this recent referendum. There's been a, a, there was a recent referendum, to your point. I mean, 70% of the Swiss population um, actually, um, require, they're forcing publicly listed Swiss companies to submit to their shareholders and to approve compensation for their executives. Uh, and they're also forcing uh, the pension funds and, and the in investors to reveal how they vote. Um, so it, in a way, it's sort of an assault on, you know, the corporate governance of publicly listed Swiss companies like Nestle because, you, you know, if you look at the chairman of, of, of Swiss Re, he makes 11 times the amount of, as the chairman of Munich Re, although, the, although they're fundamentally the same businesses and one's bigger than the other, uh, the chairman of Nestle makes 10 times more than the chairman of Unilever. And, you know, the, so there clearly there's been some abuses at the, in terms of excessive public compensation, which you get into a whole different discussion about the agency problems of publicly listed companies. And, and um, I think there's, you know, basically, I think, I, I don't know if John Bogle, this, he was a Princeton graduate, the, the founder of Vanguard, but I, you know, people read some of his work. But, you know, this whole apathy of shareholders uh, because of mutual funds and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the incentive systems there, et cetera, don't seem to provide a very good check and balance on on these executives and these companies. So the Swiss government, actually, the Swiss populace, they, 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 what happened was there was a, a fellow with a very small business who um, Swiss Air, when it went bankrupt, did not pay their bill and for, this, for a guy who had 200 employees. And, and it put his business at, at, at risk. And then he, re he read about that the CEO got a payment of $15 million to leave. And so he, he gathered 30,000 votes and said, no, I don't, you know, this isn't right. That was, that was like I don't know, four or five years ago. And now this law went into place. It was lots of debate, lots of discussion. And you know, actually, the, the Economy Suisse, which is the big association of industries, spent a lot of money trying to convince the populace that it was a bad idea. But 70% of people actually voted in favor of this. And it was a real wake-up call. It's, 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 it's meant to be sort of cutting edge uh, um, legislation uh, with regard to this whole issue of you know, sort of agency problems with big companies, so. Right, and that's also widely regarded in other European countries, and people think yeah, it's a potential 
<laughs> you know, pe 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 people are actually cri critiquing it now. So actually, Switzerland, I mean, the, the, she's absolutely right about the women thing, but I think Switzerland has changed and is becoming a bit more, uh, also with regard to, I mean, your point about the whole banking situation. Uh, I think most people widely regard the Swiss solution, um, you know, how they actually uh, confronted the UBS problem and created a bad bank and took all the bad loans and put it in there and came clean and, and actually they ended up making quite a lot of money now. But if you look at uh, how the Swiss reacted to the banking crisis, how, if you look at how the Swedes, uh, I just had dinner the other night with Lars Tunev, who um, up until recently ran the IFC, and he used to run and skill the bank. And, and actually the, the Swedish model of how they dealt with their crisis was considered. So these small countries, I think precisely because of their vulnerability, they, they tend to, you know, they don't muddle through things. Um, they, they, they sort of tend to come to grips with it because a lot of it is, is at stake. Regarding um, transparency in the Swiss banking system. Yeah, I had a, I had an interview with o Oswald Grubel, who ran Credit Suisse and turned it around, and then he was brought in to turn around UBS, and he's a, an orphan from the eastern part of Germany and widely regarded as one of the most respected bankers. And he says, "Look, um, when I started in this business, you had three or four journalists, and you had five or six analysts, and." You know that's all there was, and you could you could really sort of manipulate and convince people. He says, "No, I, I have you know Twitters and this and that and the other thing." I mean, because of this transparency, I think that's one of the actual issues that Switzerland has to deal with. Because it's a, it's a, if you if you like, it's against their mindset. You know this this idea of transparency. But I think with the whole internet now, we we are living in a much more transparent world, and I think it's there's very good things about that and and very bad things about that. But um, I, I think the bank secrecy is, is to a large extent been decided and it's no longer uh, a viable part of any bank strategy going forward. It's just a question of how to get from A to B. <clears throat> There's not much resistance there. Also, uh, how hard is it to start a business? Are most businesses owned privately, or can you, is it easily, easily to get a loan from a bank to start a business? Yeah. I, I think standard of living is high, and it's, it's high, and, and wages are high, and you know, costs are a bit high for, for lots of things, but um, you, know, you don't have this sort of acute competition that you have here. Um, you know, I remember seeing a cartoon with... Uh, California, I think you're from California, and uh, well, t these two housewives talking about, oh, you know, how terrible it is that Walmart's coming, and you know, we should really do this, that, and the other thing. And then the last caption was, oh, they're having a sale. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I, I think it's, you know, it, I don't think it's that expensive. Um, I think it's, you, you know, you, you, there's a decent level of wages. Just a more, probably a more you know, sort of a tighter dispersion of um, wages and, than, than most countries. Um, and, yeah, and then to start a business, I, I think it's easy to start a business. I think the Swiss are probably one of the, the criticisms you'd have is that they're, they're very afraid to make mistakes, um, which I think is an issue because it, to actually, you know, to, to succeed in life, sometimes you do have to take chances and you have to fail and, um, you know, the Vegs of Eisheit geht nur über Fehler. That's a German expression from Goethe. That the, the, the pathway to, to wisdom always goes over mistakes. You know. So, but I remember uh, going to meetings of the ITU, International Telecommunications Union in Geneva, and being impressed that half the town of the Geneva is international organizations. Yeah. And to answer the question, everybody was on per diem, so it was very, you know. Yeah. The cost of living was very high in Geneva. Uh, but I suspect the reason for it is the neutrality of, um, right. of Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, after all, they stayed out of World War II and so on. Uh, can you say, give us a feel for, the, for a foreign policy of Switzerland? I mean, are they <laughs> trying not to have feelings about what else? 
all over the world that the universe concerned with is around the earth, spring and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want to, you, you, should we ask the ambassador? Would you like to say something? Or go ahead. I'm sure, why not? Um, I think in terms of uh, foreign policy, we are also concerned about Iran. Actually, I don't want to, uh, if you know, but we represent the American interests in Iran. Um, so this is one very large part of our foreign policy is what we call good offices. Um, because we are neutral, we are often perceived as a good mediator in conflicts. We're small, we don't have any interests or vested interests. Um, so we, we, for example, uh, in, between Armenia and Turkey, We have a very large UN um, presence, but not only UN, NGOs, um, uh, think tanks also in Geneva. So I think that is also a very important aspect of our, of our foreign policy. Um, human rights, um, we're very engaged. The Human Rights Council is now located in, in Geneva. Um, so I think those are, those are two aspects I don't want to monopolize the, the time. But um, we have probably what you would consider a, a, a discrete foreign policy, but a very Swiss Air flew the um, uh, embassy escapees out of Tehran in the movie Argo. Yeah. Swiss, Swiss, soldier, Swiss soldiers still protect the Vatican. So that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, an uh, anecdote, I remember um, Victor Blancard, who's a famous, uh, one of your colleagues, he's a, he's, he was a very famous, um, well, yeah, state secretary. Um, it's this point about the Swiss government, you know, the, this unique recipe of sort of weak government and strong industry. Um, and he was saying in Brazil there's two people that the, the prime minister in Brazil would see within 24 hours. One was a, an American ambassador to Brazil, and, and the second one was the CEO of Nest, Nestle in Brazil. <laughs> So that's sort of, <laughs> I thought that was quite interesting. And it was sort of, this is coming from a government uh, representative. Uh, yeah, it's more discreet diplomacy, I think. Um, and the industry, I think, is, you know, you have very important industrial investors from Swiss companies in these countries. And so you rest assured that they're also in touch with these, these people. They have a, a vested interest that things go right. Yes, sir. If we have time for one more question, I'd like to find out. Recently, I read in the news that when it comes to investment banking, Singapore is the new Switzerland. And I was wondering if Switzerland is losing its grip of power on investment banking and banking business. Yeah, I mean, I, I think S Singapore is becoming very important because wealth creation in Asia is becoming very important. It's a disproportionate share of the, the, the growth potential in the private banking sector. But you have companies, I mean, the Swiss are very big in Singapore. I, I don't know, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they're, I think UBS has about 12,000 employees there. Uh, the government of Singapore is, a, is the biggest shareholder of UBS. Um, and I think you're right to sort of point that out. Uh, as a competitive center, um, Singapore is attractive. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. But, you know. Yeah, I, th I actually think this is quite interesting, this discussion, because this whole private banking offshore money is, I, I just probably would like to say that there's a huge debate going on about the equitability of taxation anywhere. It's, you know, you know the U.S. has their Delaware companies, you know, the, the U.K. has a, um, a relationship to the, you know, the, the Chennai Islands and Cayman Islands, and um, all of this is sort of in the same, you know, salad of debate. Uh, and then you have these issues of multinational companies. You know, the, the U.S. pharmaceutical companies have huge reserves because it's, 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 from a tax point of view, very disadvantageous to repatriate them back to the U.S. for they'd have to pay, effectively dividend them back and then have to pay the tax on that. So I, I think you're going to be seeing, and you're seeing it in the U.K., and I think, Harold, probably you're following that as well, but there's, there's a lot of debate now about just this whole concept of the fairness of, of taxation. And I think 
part of that is this traditional, you know, this you know, Switzerland, Swiss money, etc. But there's a lot more to it than that. It's just you know, industrial companies. Where, where are they based, and where are they paying taxes, and is it fair? And, 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 and you're seeing these discussions. You have people in all these major corporations that are tax you know, running a tax department, which are actually profit centers. So they're actually you know they're actually encouraged to reduce these taxes because it, it means more profits to shareholders, and that of course creates some unusual uh, distortions. No, I just wanted to add, uh, apropos of Singapore, I think Singapore is perceived more as a threat uh, uh, for the trading business. Uh, I, I happen to be a resident of Geneva. Uh, and, uh, what, a resident of where? Geneva. Ah, oh, good, okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's perceived to be uh, a threat for the trading business, more so than for banking. And Geneva has been extremely successful in attracting trading companies and activities out of London. London is uh, losing yeah. uh, uh, very rapidly. And, uh, you know, it is by now uh, by far the largest uh, place for uh, physical trading of oil, and, for example, and many other commodities. And Singapore uh, has been actively, you know, trying to attract uh, business away from, from Geneva. But it's interesting that this was, uh, you know, discussed and actively discussed and the government has uh, come out with a paper recently to uh, uh, signify that they are aware of this and in general uh, I would say uh, coming back to the issue of foreign policy uh, I see a level of awareness of the issue of competitiveness uh, of the country that uh, I don't uh, easily find in any other yeah. European country or the United States in the sense that the level of priority that is attributed to, to maintaining this competitiveness is very high, and everybody's yeah. conscious that this is crucial. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, you don't right. uh, attribute importance to, to other things, or you are ready to sacrifice other things in order to maintain this competitiveness. Yeah. No, I think the Swiss people is, um, you know, they, they put a lot of value on prosperity. Uh, people in Vienna put a lot of value on music, and French people put a lot of value on food, and and you know, um, you know, here they put a lot of value on baseball and uh, whatever. But you know, there is a, as you're saying, I think there's a, and being a small country, country you know, you're, you're there, you, there's, a, there's there's maybe also an element of paranoia um, of this, and, and that's sort of keeping them on their toes as well, and. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I do think there's this, this sort of a disposition that's different than other places. <coughs> Very interesting discussion. I'm I already signed. I already signed your book, so, yeah, you <laughs> it, so I can say whatever I want. Now, right? <laughs> All right. I'm uh, originally from Switzerland. I've been living in this beautiful town for 15 years, yeah. and I have just a couple of things to add to this discussion. I think personally. It's very interesting, you're right, right? When you leave your country of origin, your environment you're used to, of course, you become very sensitive yeah. to differences. And yeah. sometimes you have to move away to know your own yeah. country better. Absolutely. Right? And then there are a lot of things, actually, we, experience, we have experienced here in the U.S., and I thought, oh, in Switzerland it's all different, you know, this is typical American. And more and more, when I traveled back to Switzerland, mm. I discovered that a lot of these things actually now are in Switzerland also. Mm. It seems, you know, also this whole, you know, of course, you know, the, the world is becoming a global village. I think the differences mm. are becoming less. Yeah. And it's actually very interesting when you mention global corporations, you know, they seem to be headquarters in, headquartered in Switzerland. Some of them, some of them headquartered here, some of them are headquartered or wherever, but you know, there seems to be a community of global corporations and it's yeah. questionable, you know, how much actually they still reflect I agree. a national identity. That's and, what and I would... then going back to Switzerland, I think there's a big mm. consciousness of that. More and more now the big topic in Switzerland when I travel back is actually that they say, our companies are not Swiss anymore. You know, and you look at all the CEOs yeah. and people in key positions in Switzerland, there's a big complaint that the percentage of 
people who are actually in those key positions are not Swiss anymore. Absolutely. So and, uh, that, that I was trying to sort of point that out with his aircraft carrier that um, for the time being, Switzerland is a preferred place to do business, not just for these Swiss multinationals, but you know, Dow Chemical has its European headquarters, Google has its biggest research center outside of um, outside of the U.S. You have Tetra Pak, which is you know one of the biggest packaging companies from Sweden. Um, you know, Merck. Uh, probably about 10% of the GDP of Switzerland are foreign, sort of these foreign multinationals. And I think they d increasingly decide the same way as the Swiss multinationals. I think they're just fungible. They're, they're actually deciding things very similar. Uh, the good news is, is right now Switzerland is the flavor of the month and they really love it. Um, but, you know, if those conditions were to change, I think they would be, you know, if, if Singapore, for example, would be a more desirable place to conduct business, then, um, then I think that the, the loyalty and commitment compared to these Brüllers and Holdebanks, you know, I think there's the, the, gr the degree of allegiance is much more um, tenuous. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it, it is cause for concern. And, uh, not just in Switzerland, but I think anywhere. I don't think the American. I think the American companies are also becoming less American. And you know, it's 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 um, you know, this is this Davos man discussion where they think they're sort of supreme to everything. And um, and and there's also issues just just to, you know, ancillary issues which are quite important. For example, the military in Switzerland is, was you know always a very important sort of glue in a very radically decentralized um, country. And you know, I remember Fritz Gerber, who was the former chairman of Roche, told me he was a colonel in the military. And most of the Swiss companies came from the, the military up until about 15 years ago. And actually, the Israeli military copied the Swiss military. So you know, if you look at, I don't know if anyone read Startup Nation, but a lot of the success in Israel is attributed to their, their sort of their military elite, which was a, a, a replication of the Swiss military system. But you know, he says, look, at Roche, we um, you know, one of his colleagues from Switzerland, a young guy, he was sort of a mentor, says, I can't, I can no longer be an officer in the, in the military because I can't explain to my eight other colleagues who are Spanish and Swedish and Indonesian, you know, why I should be spending four weeks a year doing free civil service. And, and historically, that was a very important glue and a very important, um, you know, sort of way of reducing the channels of decision making. You know, the UBS bank crisis, I met with one of the key lawyers, and he was also an, a, an important person in the military. And that could be done very quickly because all these people were in the military together. So you know, no contracts, no, just telephones. And everyone knew if, it, if your word is your word. And so, you know, it's, that is waning. And it, it remains to be seen what sort of impact that has. But it's, it's, uh, it's not an unimportant observation. I mean, on, on exactly that note, I mean, I was struck uh, how 20 years ago there was still the convention that in uh, meetings where people came from different parts of Switzerland, uh, somebody spoke Swiss from Rome and somebody spoke German, um, and you, you understood each other. And that's completely gone, as far as I can see. It's, you know, it, 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 it's really, I mean, part because the Swiss from Rome can't understand the, the, the dialect uh, German, but uh, it also because of this, this internationalization of the oh. It is. And also, I, th I think this whole point about immigration, which I think is important, um, you, know, you have to also realize that 20 years ago, not that many people spoke English. So if you, you know if you weren't happy as an Italian, you know you went to Lugano. You didn't go to London. Um, and if you weren't happy as a French person, you went to Geneva. And if you're German, but you know now with everyone speaking English and the world being so, you know maybe they go to Hong Kong or so. You know that's. You know, you have to, that, that will be different, of course, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much for a great Thank you. Yeah.